many of you have heard of uh, some of my background and some of what we've done. I want to run through uh, a little bit of what we're seeing, but I want to lift up a level and highlight what I think are the key issues that we're facing globally uh, today that are not so obvious uh, to the naked eye, uh, and then talk about why, uh, why Toronto. Um, I'm a Waterloo grad. Um, the minute I graduated, I left. I went to Europe for 10 years. Um, I was restructuring large European companies, mostly French ones, which is why I'm bold, and I think uh, many of you will understand that. Uh, French companies don't like to be restructured. Um, and uh, came, to, came back here in 98, 99, and I tried to raise money for a startup, and it was unbelievably difficult back then. And uh, the, the idea that VC should actually venture capital was seemed alien. Um, we kept trying to remind them that you're supposed to do the venture part also. And risk taking was, was hard for that world. Uh, ended up in New York, did a bunch of startups there. And I ended up in, in, in Silicon Valley as the head of innovation at Yahoo, uh, running their incubator for a couple of years. And I found, uh, learned a really central lesson, which is if you attempt disruptive innovation in any large organization, the immune system will attack you. All our organizations are built to resist change and withstand risk, and yet that's now the high order bit. And so we've been thinking about that and been kind of, that's been stuck in my brain for quite a while now. And then uh, through, after the Yahoo experience, ended up uh, starting and helping start Singularity University, uh, which has now been going on for eight years or so. Um, this organization, I think, sets the groundwork for what's happening in the world today in terms of the insight that we get across all of these technologies. This orange graph that Ray Kurzweil put together is kind of fundamental to this. It's a, it's a graph of Moore's Law. Uh, and Ray went all the way back to 1900 and found that we've been doubling computational price performance for over 100 years, well before Gordon Moore made his predictions. And the question that he asked is, why is that curve so smooth and so predictable? We've had wars and recessions and ups and downs in the semiconductor industry. You should expect a very jag jagged type of stock market shaped curve, not this very steady progression that we see here. And Ray spent a full 10 years researching this, trying to understand why this was the case. And he came up with a really fundamental observation, which is once you take any domain or discipline or industry area or product area, and you power it with information technologies, and it acquires informational flow properties, its price performance starts doubling very steadily. Most importantly, once that doubling starts, it just doesn't stop, it just keeps going. And that's very hard to get our heads around. If you can see the data there, we've gone through several technologies in computing, vacuum tubes and transistors, integrated circuits, et cetera, and each one is like a little S-curve. A technology takes off, reaches, accelerates, reaches its upper limits, but then some, if you have an information-based paradigm, something always takes over that curve. Right? We're now reaching the life cycle end of integrated circuits, and if you read the tech press, you'll see all these stories about Moore's Law is flowing down, it was a good run, but now it's kind of winding down, et cetera, et cetera. We absolutely don't believe that. When you've seen five times in a row this curve keep going, something else will take over. So today we have 3D chip design, we have optical computing, quantum computing, et cetera, et cetera. I won't get into that because anything quantum, it seems to work. Nobody knows quite how, it requires a lot of alcohol to get into, so we'll just, we'll just leave that there. Uh, and so this acceleration is now occurring in about a dozen technologies. We have never seen this before, that we have a 12 or 14 technologies moving at this doubling pattern. And this is a completely unique point in human history. It led Peter to write this book, Abundance, charting out that if we can harness this pace of change effectively, we'll soon see an abundance of healthcare, education, clean water, energy in about a decade. And what will the world look like if that was the case, right? Uh, Peter, of course, is the founder of the XPRIZE Foundation. I joined their board a couple of months ago, and they use prizes to solve global problems and, and challenges globally. Um, this is leading to some extraordinary outcomes. We're digitizing the world very dramatically. We're disrupting it heavily as a result. Uh, we're demonetizing industries as a result. We've seen kind of the drop off in newspaper revenues the, news, uh, the TV business is hitting that drop off today. Entire industries start to cycle through this kind of curve. And, and as I mentioned, it's very hard to get our heads around this. Our brains do not cognitively understand exponential growth very well at all. And I want to get a, give a couple of examples of that a bit later. If I take 30 steps linearly, the story goes, I'll get to 30 meters. We can all predict very well where I am a third or two thirds of the way in that progression. But if I take 30 doubling steps, 24816, I get to a billion meters at step 30, 
which is actually 26 times around the world, uh, very hard to gauge where is one third or two thirds of the way in that progression. And much more of the world is operating on this heuristic. So if you don't spot that doubling pattern early, it disrupts you very badly. If you disrupt it early, it's the biggest advantage you could possibly have. Right? Quick show of hands. How many of you had heard of 3D printing five years ago? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, a bunch of you. 10 years ago? Okay, 15 years ago? So 3D printing is actually 34 years old. It is not a new technology. But when it first came out in the early 80s, the price performance was terrible. You could print out like 0.001 widgets an hour. Uh, two years later, it doubled to 0.002 widgets later uh, an hour. Two years later, 0.004. Two years later, 0.008. And for a long time, it just looks like zero. Then it hits the knee, the curve hits 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.6. Things go crazy. Then we call it a black swan. Right? And we're seeing this, as I said, in technology after technology, industry after industry, price performance is absolutely uh, accelerating. And here's one way I like to frame it. This is a 700-year look at the cost of life, all the way from 1300 to today. And really interesting is the shape of this curve. You can see it was very, very expensive to light up a house or a room. Then it plateaued for a while. And then it crashes pretty much to zero as we industrialize it and kind of make it uh, scale to a mass audience, right? And as I said, the shape of this curve is quite interesting because here's the shape of the curve for sequencing DNA. And you see a very similar shape, very expensive plateaus for all crashes pretty much to zero. Here's the cost of solar modules and you see the same shape. In fact, solar is a fascinating one. We are doubling every 22 months today the price performance of solar cells. At this pace, we will be able to deliver 100% of world energy supply using solar in about 14 years. Okay? And the implications of that are very, very profound. The Middle East pretty much collapses. The US has to find other reasons to go to war. Uh, all sorts of interesting uh, things happen. Um, the Athabasca oil sands are in fairly big trouble as a result, et cetera, et cetera. And so huge implications around just that, right? And you think of the implications of that. If we had 100% in 14 years, we have to remember it's doubling every two years. So in 16 years, you have 200%. In 18 years, you have 400%. In 20 years, you have 800%, and that just keeps going. And it's re that's the part that's really interesting is that these doubling patterns don't stop, right? And if you worry about there's not enough solar out there, it turns out if you add up all of our fossil fuel reserves globally, all of the oil and coal and natural gas that we have in the whole world, that adds up to five days of sunlight hitting the world. So that shifts the conversation from a scarcity problem to a conversion problem, and that's what's happening to the conversion. And this is incredible. So energy today is about a $6 trillion business globally. As we shift to solar, totally rewrites the underlying equation that whole industry essentially collapses. We expect about a five to six X drop in revenues over a two to three decade period. Right? By the way, the poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world. Right? So really interesting geopolitical power shifts coming along there. Um, and as I mentioned, this is very, very hard to spot. Uh, when the Google car first came out eight, nine years ago, the cost of the LIDAR, the GPS, the radar, the sensors added up to about $200,000 a car. And all the car companies looked at that and said, ah, cute research project, but you'll never commercialize that. Two years later, it was $100,000 a car. Uh, two years later, $50,000 a car. Even then, the response was, well, who will pay $50,000 for all those sensors? If you're aware, we're down below $1,000 a car across the board, across all of the sensors, and now everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. The cost of that LiDAR unit at the top of that Prius cost $75,000 five years ago. Okay? Uh, we're down today to about $50 for that equivalent. Why? Because you have two or three technologies. Each of them is doubling in its own way, but where they intersect, that adds a whole other multiplier to the equation, and the aggregate effect is orders of magnitude very quickly. And I said, very hard to get our heads around. And the next version will be $10, and it'll totally dematerialize into our smartphones. We've seen this with our GPS systems, and we'll soon see this with LiDAR. Right? And everybody in that car industry didn't see this coming because it's really hard cognitively. I want to give a couple more examples of this. Um, 10 years ago, we had maybe half a billion internet-connected devices out in the world. Uh, we're up today to about 15 billion. Ericsson made this prediction in 2010. They said we'd have 50 billion internet-connected devices by the end of the decade. And at the time, the entire tech world said, that makes no sense. We only have five, six billion people in the world. Why would we need 50 billion devices? And I talked to Ericsson a few months ago, and they said we were wrong about the 50 billion. Our new prediction is 500 billion by the end of the decade. <laughs> and something we see very consistently is when an expert in a domain that's growing exponentially makes a prediction, they're typically wrong by about 10x. 
We're fond of saying an expert will tell you how you cannot do something. Right? And all of our organizations and all of our institutions are filled with experts with multiple decades of experience in that domain. That's so very hard. Uh, even in, this, in the en solar energy world, uh, 12 years ago, 2003, oh, 14 years ago now, the leading expert in the world in solar energy made this comment. He said, look, if you add up the cost of the physical components, this, the silver, the glass, the wiring, we will never drop below a dollar a watt. That's the, that's the floor, that's as low as you can go. It's just the physical reality of it. You can see from that blip, the market actually believed him for a little while. Then it started to drop, kept dropping. We're down to about 15 cents a watt today, and his comment at the bottom is very telling. He says, okay, getting below a dollar has exceeded my expectations, right? And even the leading expert in this domain has a tough time with this. So this is really tough, and it's cognitively hard to get around. And we spend a lot of time kind of breaking through old people's old habits to get a sense of what's possible today. Um, uh, today, we're seeing kind of the rampant rise of solar energy. Chile is already generating so much solar, it's giving it to its neighbors for free. A quarter of the farms in, in California are already solar powered. And maybe in the most ultimate irony around this, the coal museum in Kentucky is now powering itself with solar. You know. and, and how do you look yourself in the mirror, right? How do you do that, okay? And just incredible. And so this is some of the chaos that's happening and the turbulence that's happening as we kind of roll this paradigm out globally. Now the technology is all very sexy. We can kind of go on for, for a long time, but we have a really fundamental problem, which is that our societies are not set up to absorb this pace of change. Okay? In fact, I argue that every mechanism by which we run society, our civics, our politics, our legal systems, our healthcare systems, education, intellectual property, you name it, all designed for a incremental, linear, stable, predictable world. They were all designed several centuries ago when the world was local and linear. Anything important happened within a day's walk. Today, something that happens in Tokyo or Miami affects us in minutes, right? And, and again, the, the, our visceral effect of trying to get our heads around this is very, very difficult. Um, and this, we're seeing the stress. If you think about our leadership today, all of our leaders globally are not able to articulate this magical future that we're living into, abundance of energy, which means clean water becomes easy. When you have clean water, 60% of infectious diseases disappear, et cetera, et cetera. We end up back in the fear factor. Here's the prime minister of Turkey from last year, right? Here's the US, it, its amygdala and its, free, its kind of immune system freaking out, trying to address old problems uh, new problems using old solutions. Here's the Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy in the US. Um, a fundamental pillar of American society has disappeared with no public conversation about it. A constitution is the software that runs a country and you need to be able to update it now and then. And how do you do that in this environment? So very difficult. In fact, I'll argue that we are even reaching this, all of our institutions are under, under threat. Okay? And I could go on about a number of these. Uh, think about, we're, we're gonna double human lifespan in the next kind of, say, 10 to 20 years. Think about religion. Most religions are trying to sell you an afterlife as a business model, right? How do you sell heaven, how do you sell heaven if nobody's dying, right? That's kind of, a, kind of a challenge. We invented marriage, I joke about marriage, we invented marriage several thousand years ago, and at the time, average lifespan was about 25 years old. So you got married, you had kids, and you died. Marriage is, not, marriage is not designed to last 50, 60 years. Uh, my, my, joke, my joke about that is that's, that's state-sanctioned torture, so that's... that's uh, but, but very seriously, this is affecting all of us globally, right? Uh, think about the rise of fundamentalism globally. Pockets of people in every ideology, you know, uh, Hindu nationalists, Muslim radicals, Christian evangelicals, Jewish settlers, in every ideology, people are saying, I can't take this pace of change. Let's go back to an older time when things were better. Maybe the biggest insight I've had watching the stress is that human beings would much rather be comfortable than happy. And because we know kind of what happened in the past, we try and go back to it. It's a fallacy, but this is the challenge, right? And all of our institutions today are at breaking point. And so the thing I've been thinking of is how do we rewrite our institutions? And, and often in our institutions, and, the, and especially the public sector, our existing policy is the immune system. You try and update education, the teachers' unions attach, attack you. You try and update transportation, the taxis go crazy, and so on. And so we have to figure this out, and I've been looking at this for quite a while. I wrote this book three years ago, think, talking about how organizations react to this new pace of change. And we came up with some interesting uh, theories. And I want to give you two pieces of what's happening in the world today. 
um, uh, and what's the underlying cause, right? So the first is, you know, very clearly we're pepper spraying our civics and our politics. We're seeing incredible stress around the world with what's happening globally. And I'll argue that we're actually shifting the modality of the world from a male archetype to a female archetype. Uh, we run the world today to a, on a set of very male archetypal structures, uh, the corporation, the military industrial complex, Judeo-Christian religions, top-down pyramid structures, usually a man at the top. If you look at the rise of Burning Man, the maker movement, the open source movement, the internet, we're moving to a, a, a kind of a female archetype. And we've used this kind of to ratchet back and forth throughout civ the history of civilization to update ourselves. And we're, the tension that we see in the world is moving from that male archetype to a female archetype. The male archetype is really good at managing scarcity, right? Command and control, go grab it, optimize for things, increased efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. But as the world moves to, to abundance, we actually need a female archetype. When the male archetype goes into stress, it goes into the fight or flight response. And we're seeing that stress today in all of our government systems globally. When the female archetype goes into stress, they tend to tend and befriend. They don't go to a fight or flight response. Right? And research has proven this out. Now, when the male archetype uh, kind of connects with power and abundance, it relates to it as power and tries to hoard it. Wall Street, Middle East oil, et cetera. When the female archetype meets abundance, they share it around. And that's what we see on the internet, networking, participatory, nurturing environments, which is what we're slowly moving to. And in biology, they've actually figured this out. Fire ants in, Latin, in Central America have, you have these hives of fire ants, and they rip each other to shreds, if you watch any of the videos around this. They're actually a complete war. Uh, but when they got to the U.S., they found there was abundance. They rewrote their own genes, and in the U.S., they cooperate. They do not fight. And so biology has already figured this out. Evolution is quite a bit ahead of us in this case. The big question is, how do we update our cultural structures? How do we update our cultural institutions? The second thing that's happening, aside from this, I think we're moving from, you know, we've run the world very successfully for the last few hundred years on money, capitalism, commerce, um, uh, uh, commerce is the main mode of discourse in the world today. Right? But we're shifting that now from money to information. Banks used to use move money around, and now they move information about money around. And you have Bitcoin coming along, which is a currency of abundance in a sense. And how do we deal with that? Because how do we deal with taxation when, when you have this demonetization taking place and we're shifting uh, the world into information very radically? Very clearly, soon, education will be essentially free uh, we shouldn't be, have to pay for it. Uh, and now we're starting to see the stress coming from that. Now, we have two futures that we can kind of live into as we go through this world. Right now, all of this technology is driving us through extraordinary stress, and we're seeing the societal disruption, political, financial, social, that's coming from that. We have to figure out how to tilt that and change that future into a future of abundance. We have a, a, a Vivek Wadwa, one of our colleagues, talks about this as either a Mad Max society or a Star Trek society, right? Very clearly today we're heading towards the Mad Max side of things. And we need to figure out how to tilt that. And I've been thinking about that. A couple of years ago, I talked to the global CIO of Procter & Gamble, uh, and she said, hey, could you help us with your work? We've, the book is required reading. And what we found with big companies, it typically takes about two and a half, three years to get their senior leadership fully up to date to make meaningful change to adapt to this new world. And I proposed to her a sprint. And we came up with a 10-week process that we run that solved the immune system problem in large companies. As so we're able to move the leadership and culture three years ahead in a 10-week period, we piloted it with uh, Procter & Gamble. We've now run it several times, and so we're very thrilled about the outcomes. We're actually going to open source this, write a manual on how to do it, and make it widely available. And so we kind of solved the immune system problem in the private sector. Then I thought, how would you apply this to the public sector? And in, in, well, as I mentioned earlier, in the public sector, our existing policies are the immune system. Right? You have a new technology like drones, and the first response is ban the drones, and then slowly open that tap to get advantage, take advantage of it. At the pace we're going, it takes many, many years to get uh, full advantage of this. So we created in, uh, in Miami a, something we call the Fast Track Institute, which I'm trying to move here, actually. Um, where we want to look at uh, technology and problem-solving cities uh, and approach it from a different perspective. So we take a problem like, say, transportation, and we look at all the technologies that may come along to affect that. Then we look, do a design thinking layer as to how would you come up with solutions for these. Then we go through a funding layer. Do you privatize? Do you raise taxes, et cetera? And the last one is the most critical. While we're evaluating the technology, 
we're looking at what are the social and practical and policy changes, regulatory changes, public safety needs that you can change, that you need to change in order to implement it. So that when you finish the evaluation, you can hit the ground running. And so we've run this four times in Medellin, in Colombia. We're about to do the same thing in Miami with the mayor of Miami, four months on the future of transportation. And we have found that we can solve a problem facing a city for about one-tenth the current cost. And so the economic benefit becomes quite profound because these new technologies are orders of magnitude cheaper than the previous ones. Right? As my colleague Brad Templeton said, you, if you lay down train lines, you can run trains, 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 or trains. But if you have a road, you can have about 14 or 15 different transportation types. And so we're doing this uh, in Miami, assuming uh, when the water subsides. I've actually been living in Miami the last three years, by the way, because uh, we've, our calculations are that in about 20 years, Miami is gone. So better enjoy it while it's there before it completely <laughs> sinks under the, under the ocean. And um, uh, so we'll see how that works out. Because this pace of change is not slowing down. It's actually accelerating. And we have to adapt society very quickly to this new world. And this is why I'm back here. I moved back to Toronto. Um, actually, our, our son moved us back. We, he went into the Mabin School in Toronto, and he said, I really love here. I never want to leave. We're like, wait a minute. What about your friends in Miami? He said, I'll visit them. Uh, and so we're, we're back. Uh, and as we are, um, I'm fi we're finding that Toronto is a really great place to do these big ideas. And the collaborative nature, the diversity, the open uh, discussion between government and private sector are fascinating. The US goes backwards for 20 years now, in our opinion, and it'll take a while before we figure that out. Right? Uh, this is the Gartner hype cycle that many of you are familiar with, uh, where they chart out a technology, it reaches a peak of its uh, hype, and then it goes through a trough. I think we're in the, actually a hype cycle of civilization. We kind of peaked in the 50s. Um, now we're kind of heading into a trough, and we need to transition all of our social systems and our civics and our our struct societal mechanisms from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. We're gonna go through about a 20 year period of extreme stress as we figure out how to transition these. Our existing leaders can't do it. I think about our existing leaders all uh, having learned their craft in a world that was incremental, uh, uh, scarcity based, material based. They are not set up to manage through a world of extreme disruption that's coming. So we actually need completely new leaders which is part of the F effort of uh, Singularity University. But more than that, we need actually new institutions. And that's what I'd like to do, help uh, start to craft. And actually, Toronto is the place uh, that we've chosen to do this. Um, because here, with what's happening, if you look at the collaborative nature of it, uh, we can actually start doing some really magical things. In about a month, we're having the Singularity Summit. We're bringing all our faculty here. Uh, we're having a conference a bit later in January on this whole EXO paradigm. Our old business models are all about managing scarcity and selling scarcity, right? If you, if, if you didn't have scarcity in the past, you didn't have a business. But today we're finding new business models around abundance. Airbnb is tapping into an abundance of extra bedrooms, Uber an abundance of cars. Uh, we'll soon find those same business models in energy. And so that's where we're going to be heading soon. And I love the collaborative nature of, of this. And so 20 years of being away, a number of years in Silicon Valley, a number of years in Miami, we're finally back here. And this is where I'd like to start. And I think Toronto is the place to do it. So thank you very much. It's been great to be here. The conference is awesome. Thank you. Thank you.